So thank you, thank you all very much uh, for coming. Um, and it's always good to see the challenge of the long queue, which means the people who we have here are the people who've shown the greatest initiative or who have the best contacts. Um, <laughs> the, I'm not going to spend long introducing because the reason you're here is that you've come to listen to Mark Carney and Amartya Sen, so you know who they are. But very quickly, um, our speaker, Mark Carney, has been Governor of the Bank of England since um, July of 2013. He has a real economics education from Harvard and doctorate from Oxford. He uh, was uh, in, the investment, in the investment banking for a dozen or so years, Deputy Minister of Finance of Canada, Governor of the Bank of Canada. But most importantly, uh, because this is the LSE and a university, is someone who thinks very deeply about the responsibilities, the big responsibilities that he has. And he has that very rare talent of being able to think and act at the same time, uh, which is a requirement of the job, but uh, not all people who have that kind of jobs have that ability. He's also been thinking very deeply about... Um, stability of various kinds, not only financial, but beyond financial stability. It's been thinking very hard about distributional issues, along, of course, with the uh, basic job that he has to do around inflation and output. So, Mark, you're enormously welcome, uh, welcome here. Um, Amartya Sen is Professor of Economics and Philosophy at Harvard. He's been professor at the uh, Delhi School, most importantly, of course, in a glittering career with the years he spent at the London School of Economics, uh, Oxford Master of Trinity, and so on. One of the great public intellectuals of this century and last century, he's reminded us constantly of the importance of public reasoning. And I think we do have two Enlightenment figures here to uh, uh, first mark to give a talk and then Amartya to respond to Enlightenment figures who take value seriously, reasoning seriously, evidence uh, seriously, and transparency seriously. Um, I underline those things because this is a good time to underline those things. Um, so um, we will first have Mark for half an hour or so, and then Amartya will respond I may ask a question or two, but then we will open it to the audience. Um, I'll take three questions in a row. Uh, we'll try to get as many as possible in as, uh, as we can. And I'll try to uh, give priority to uh, students. Um, but of course, knowing who's a student isn't always that uh, easy, but I'll try to give priority to students. And there is a tradition in the school that we look for gender balance in questioning uh, in the questions as well. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you particularly, Mark and Amartya, to, for coming. It's a privilege to uh, be here with you. Welcome to the LSC. And Mark, could you please talk to us? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, thanks, all of you, for... Uh, Coming this evening, I must say it is a, uh, I didn't think I'd ever actually be up here uh, many times. I've been there uh, listening to the greats, including, uh, including Nick, um, and, uh, and learning a tremendous amount. Uh, I'm looking forward to sitting down and learning a lot more uh, once Amartya and Nick uh, get back up. Um, it is an honor uh, for me to share this uh, podium with the two of you. Um, and particularly uh, Professor Sen, whose uh, latest book is out today, as it happens. Um, uh, I haven't read it yet. Um, it's very good. I'm, <laughs> see, <laughs> it's out today. He's already read it, and he's done five other things uh, today as well, which uh, shows why he's been up here a lot longer than I have. Um, Professor Sen is rightly recognized um, for his many, many contributions, not least uh, to welfare economics and to social choice theory. He's posed and answered many of the most fundamental uh, questions uh, facing economists, and in, indeed facing uh, all of us. Um, for example, given the diversity of people's preferences, is it possible to arrive at coherent aggregate, aggregate, 
aggregate judgments uh, about how society is arranged. If there are as many preferences as people, is, it, is reasonable social choice possible at all? And how do we, you know, simple question but difficult one to answer, how do we value public goods? His work underscores the value of empirics or informational broadening to help make the interpersonal comparisons that are necessary to understand and to act upon the force of public concerns about issues ranging from poverty to inequality, even tyranny. And his insights have been applied to the most pressing problems uh, and ethical questions, such as the prevention of famines. His insights are also relevant to social choices about macroeconomic stabilization, including inflation control, and what society is prepared to do to achieve them. So specifically, what level of inflation does society wish to achieve, and how aggressively should inflation stabilization be pursued when doing so imposes costs in terms of lost output and higher unemployment? Price stability is a public good. It's not merely that rising prices mean households have to shop around or businesses have to update their prices periodically. High inflation hurts the worst off in society, those who don't hold property, and it also hurts those whose incomes are fixed in nominal terms. And by distorting price signals and inhibiting investment, it ultimately damages the productive potential of the economy. Equally, deflation can reduce growth, increase unemployment, and in the extreme, bring financial collapse. The happy medium is low, stable, predictable inflation, a little inflation to grease the wheels of the economy, and to give monetary policy the space to deliver better outcomes for jobs and growth when shocks hit. Now, recognizing the social value of inflation control is one thing. Delivering it is quite another. In the past, quite simply, many societies couldn't. And this was because the instrument that affects inflation most powerfully, monetary policy, also affects output and employment, at least in the short run. That influence tempted authorities to promise low inflation in the future, but then to renege in order to boost activity. Electoral cycles reinforce this predisposition. Firms and households began to anticipate these incentives, and the economy ended up in a worse equilibrium. And it was such time and consistent uh, policies that led to the excessive inflation and high structural unemployment experienced here in the UK during the 70s and 80s. In light of this experience, many societies came to recognize that macroeconomic outcomes could be improved by first choosing the preferred rate of inflation and then delegating to the monetary authority the necessary responsibility to take the actions needed to achieve that objective. By tying the hands of authorities, inflation control becomes a more technical engineering problem, as described by Professor Sen's work on ethics and economics. Time inconsistency is resolved, and better outcomes for both inflation and unemployment become possible. Inflation targeting, as practiced in the United Kingdom, represents the most comprehensive adoption of these insights. The MPC of the Bank of England has been given a clear remit with lex lexicographic preference for price stability, and it's charged to do what's necessary to achieve the inflation target over the policy horizon. The UK's uh, monetary policy is grounded in society's desired objective, which is enshrined in statute and remit. In other words, society chooses the ends, and within preset boundaries, the MPC determines the means to achieve them. Yet, even in this framework, monetary policymaking will at times involve striking trade-offs between stabilizing inflation and supporting growth and employment. In other words, the monetary pro policy problem cannot be fully contracted ex ante. But those decisions about the precise trade-off that the MPC pursues are subject to the limits provided by its statutory objectives and the Chancellor's remit. And they're disciplined by numerous transparency and accountability mechanisms, including inflation reports, the minutes and transcripts of MPC meetings, the parliamentary testimonies of its members, and discussions and debates in fora such as this. Now, the balance of my remarks this evening is going to concentrate on the MPC's experience with such trade-offs, not least because they've become more common of late 
given that the UK economy has been subject to a series of major supply shocks since the global financial crisis, and because there's a renewed recognition that in extreme circumstances, the monetary policy authority may have to take into account financial stability considerations in setting monetary policy. And these are big decisions, big decisions that are subject to considerable uncertainty. And they're ones which entail potentially large welfare costs. They deserve scrutiny to ensure that they're consistent with society's preferences as expressed in statute. Now, for most of the Bank of England's 300-plus uh, year history, an assessment of whether it was acting consistent with society's view of the public good couldn't be made. To quote Eddie George, uh, even following nationalization in 1946, the bank operated under legislation which remarkably did not define our objectives or functions. Rather, the bank's constitution resembled that of the United Kingdom, comprising a rich history of law, principle, and convention. All that changed with the passing of the Bank of England Act in 1998. That act clarified the bank's responsibilities and granted it independence for the operation of monetary policy. Today, our remit requires us to achieve price stability, defined by the government to mean the 12-month CPI inflation of 2%. That inflation target is symmetric, and it applies at all times. But the remit also recognizes that inflation may deviate temporarily from target on account of shocks, and that in such exceptional circumstances, bringing inflation back to target too rapidly could cause undesirable volatility in output and employment. When this is the case, the remit directs, and I quote, in, that in informing and communicating its judgments, the committee should promote an understanding of the trade-offs inherent in setting monetary policy, including, importantly, the horizon over which the committee judges it appropriate to return inflation to target. Now, a simple, I'm going to start with a simple framework uh, for thinking about how to manage that monetary policy trade-off. Uh, shown in this, uh, this figure. The red line on the figure um, illustrates a policymaker's preferred trade-off mapping effectively the shortfall in output below potential, the output gap on the x-axis, um, that the policymaker targets or is prepared to tolerate, rather, the output gap the policymaker is prepared to tolerate for a given overshoot in inflation. The flatter the line, the less weight the policymaker places on output stabilization and the more they're willing to target or tolerate large output gaps in order to eliminate small overshoots in inflation. The blue line on the figure is the Phillips curve. And we can, if you're not familiar, we can think of it as just summarizing the structure of the economy, in particular how changes in demand by the output gap affect inflation. The economy's equilibrium is obviously the intersection of the two. In the case of an inflationary shock that induces a trade-off, the Phillips curve shifts up, monetary policy must tighten in order to lower pressure on resources uh, and inflation, such that the economy ends up back on the red line, consistent with policymaker preferences. Obviously, the slope of the Phillips curve is crucial in determining the size and the fall of output needed to reduce inflation to an acceptable level, and that's the so-called sacrifice uh, ratio. Frequently, the economy experiences aggregate demand shocks that drive inflation and output in the same direction. These can uh, include changes to government spending, changes in desire of households to consume, or uh, the uh, inclination of businesses to invest. But because monetary policy can in also influence demand, it can lean against such shocks. And if successful, it stabilizes the infl uh, inflation, and there's no trade-off. So it's divine coincidence. So if you look at this uh, figure, um, negative demand shocks move inflation and the output gap to the southwest quadrant. Positive demand shocks uh, move to the northeast. Um, in these cases, it's relatively straightforward um, to keep inflation and the output gap close to target. Close to target, of course, subject to, uh, subject to lags. Um, and in fact, when you look at the data, because of lags, you will see um, that uh, a series of observations in those um, in those uh, quadrants. And to generalize, you'll notice that the best fit line slopes somewhat up um, as opposed to down. 
um, as in, in my original uh, red one. Uh, in generalized, this is, uh, this is the great, well, it is the great moderation, and it's a period of largely, not exclusively, but largely uh, demand management. Now, things are different when shocks drive inflation up or down independently of demand. Exogenous changes in firms' pricing power, so-called cost-push shocks, are one example of shocks uh, that can do so, uh, as are shocks to the exchange rate, supply capacity, or commodity prices. In such circumstances, inflation can only be controlled by delivering an opposing movement in aggregate spending. The speed of adjustment is targeted and uh, influenced, determined by the monetary policymaker. And these are the types of shocks that have characterized the period in the UK since the global financial crisis, when there have been a series of large and largely negative uh, adjustments to the, aggregate, to the supply side of the economy, with resulting lower exchange rate, lower growth, and higher inflation. In contrast, in the US and in the euro area, uh, they've seldom faced these types of trade-offs, even since uh, the global financial crisis. So that's pictorially. Um, to represent it a bit more formally, um, we'll look at it in uh, uh, linear quadratic form. Uh, so the policymaker is optimizing a series of uh, 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 optimizing uh, this loss function relative to constraints uh, in the economy. Uh, the relevant, the relative weight that the policymaker places on output stabilization uh, is lambda, uh, often denoted lambda. The policymaker's objective is to minimize, obviously, the sum of squared deviations um, and uh, to minimize the discounted uh, present value of those losses over time. A lambda of zero, in other words, no weight on uh, output stabilization, is uh, so-called inflation nutter uh, preferences. Um, I didn't coin the term, but Charlie, you were involved in coining that term, I believe. It's entirely Mervyn. Okay, that one. Um, a positive lambda means that the policymaker is willing to strike at least some trade-off between output and inflation stabilization as directed by the MPC's remit. So the policymaker optimizes this objective function subjects to uh, the constraints that result from the aggregate behavior of the economy, including the relationship between interest rates activity, activity inflation, in other words, again, highly stylized and simplified, uh, the Phillips curve that I showed earlier. So under this simple framework, consistent uh, with the charts I showed you, but showing in linear quadratic form, um, optimal policy balances inflation overshoots with shortfalls in activity relative to potential and vice versa for undershoots. The relative size of the two deviations is governed by the strength with which higher output translates into higher inflation. The Phillips curve and the preferences of the policymaker are shown. And kappa is the slope of the Phillips curve. So looking at this, um, it's clear that the higher the lambda, in other words, the greater the weight the policymaker uh, places on output stabilization, uh, the more a given shock is allowed to flow through to inflation. If it shrinks to zero, lambda shrinks to zero, you become more of an inflation nutter, exclusively focused on inflation, um, with all of the adjustment forced through the output gap in order to keep inflation very close to target. And obviously the slope is affected by the slope of the Phillips curve. Intuitively, a flatter Phillips curve makes output costs associated with moving inflation around uh, that much higher. And as a result, a flatter Phillips curve will mean that the policymaker will optimally choose to allow inflation to be further away from target than if the Phillips curve were steeper. So having said all that out, um, what does past behavior tell us uh, reveal about uh, preferences of policymakers, and specifically the value of uh, lambda? Um, now, during the period of inflation targeting, uh, can really, in terms of the nature of the shocks, can be divided into pre- and post-crisis uh, periods. Um, again, during the Great Moderation, uh, generalizing, obviously, there was uh, slightly tougher than this, but generalizing, uh, the economy's supply capacity grew at a steady pace, and for the most part, in deviations of inflation from target reflected temporary dist disturbances to demand that drove output inflation in the same direction. Uh, genu generally, monetary policy faced few trade-offs and divine coincidence largely uh, ruled. After the crisis, it changed more supply shocks uh, and the trade-off management becomes more important. Um, taking, uh, 
trade-offs at face value suggest a value of lambda of between 0.0.1 and 0.2 for the inflation targeting period as a whole, both on the basis of data outturns um, and largely on, and on the basis of expectations of the MPC. Now, there's obviously the expectations of the MPC or the forecast of the MPC, for those who follow closely, are based on market curves of interest rates which won't match uh, 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 exact MPC uh, intentions, but uh, hopefully the errors come out on either side. Um, for the post-crisis period alone, when, the, when monetary policy trade-off was particularly stark, Lambda is estimated to be higher, around a quarter, also on the basis of both outturns and forecast. When combined with the average Phillips curve slope, a subject of much debate, what the average Phillips curve slope is and the average likely shifted over the period, uh, but for the post-crisis period, uh, assuming a Phillips curve of about a half, this implies deviations of the output gap, uh, or sorry, the, the deviations from the output gap from zero, so um, that those are allowed about half the size or the weight on those, the uh, ratio of lambda over kappa, about half the weight uh, as those on inflation from target. To put this into some context, uh, consider the preferences of the FOMC. Chair Yellen has referred to a balanced approach to trade-off management, implying equal weights on inflation and deviations from, uh, from U-star, or a so-called employment unemployment gap. Econometric studies provide a range of estimates centered around a half with some evidence of time variance. So I'm slightly mixing apples and oranges here because it's an unemployment gap instead of an output gap. Um, but it gives a sense of a greater trade-off management consistent with, um, with the difference in, um, uh, in policy mandates. So what does all this tell you? Um, it tells you, I'd like it to tell you, that uh, uh, the MPC has done what society's asked. It's tolerated periods of above-target inflation in order to support the real econ economy while at all times respecting the primacy of the inflation target. Now, all that said, it's important not to overinterpret uh, these results. Specifically, uh, the MPs, MPC's average revealed lambda in the past does not lead to a simple monetary policy rule that can govern decisions regarding inflation control in all scenarios in the future. And I stress that um, because some have suggested that monetary policy ought to follow or be evaluated against a simple rule such as the Taylor Rule. But it's Im important to remember that while such rules um, were estimates when they were developed, they were estimates of actual stances of policy. In other words, uh, they were positive descriptions of central bank behavior. And they have been reinterpreted by some as guides for what central banks should do in all circumstances. In other words, normative uh, prescriptions. Taking the past as a strict guide to the future is to assume that the nature of the shocks don't change and that the structure of the economy remains constant. And such stability is hard to square in an era of financial crises, deep and variable technological change, and potentially large shifts in openness. So there should be some time variance to lambda, and it's partly illustrated by the fact that if you, that regression that I quoted to give the estimates uh, explains about a third of the variation of the output gap over the period. So it leaves two thirds of the variation unexplained, um, even in expectation and over the post crisis period. So, what are some of the reasons why uh, lambda could vary over time? And I'll give, I'll give five. Um, the first is um, there's an, an identification problem. Uh, any lambda estimated from simple scatter plots such as these is really an, an amalgam of several elements. Uh, the first is the, and the first and most fundamental um, is the policy remit itself, what society has chosen, uh, which frames true underlying preferences that the authority must uh, pursue. But as important in, in, in revelation, if you will, is the actual trade-off struck will be influenced by how individual members of the MPC view both the nature of the shocks hitting the economy and the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. Put it simply in this framework, if members of the MPC have a different view of kappa, the slope of the Phillips curve, 
and it's entirely reasonable that they might, um, their lambdas will appear to be different. So as an exercise, and you may have to take this on, on faith, although I welcome you to do it yourself. It's not that much fun. Uh, but if you, rev if you read all of the minutes of the MPC uh, since its formation, it's fun for, fun for some, um, the vast, vast majority of differences of opinion over monetary policy appear to arise from different views of how the economy is acting as opposed to what should be done if given a shared view of, uh, of the economy. This is as it should be since society through government has chosen the degree of inflation control and provided guidance uh, about how it should be achieved. Now, the second reason why lambda might vary over time or appear to vary over time is that the nature, scale, and persistence of shocks affecting the economy uh, may vary, uh, and that influences the optimal trade-off that should be pursued. For example, commodity price shocks pass through to consumer prices relatively quickly, and the Monetary Policy Authority, and you can again see this in MPC communications, be more likely to look through those direct temporary effects on inflation. And in doing so, over the short term, inflation would be allowed to vary while the real economy remains relatively stable. So an, an observer would infer a higher value of lambda. In contrast, uh, when there's a case of more per persistent inflationary shocks, such as large movements in the exchange rate, which tend to have persistent pass-through, uh, the monetary policy maker may choose to offset some of those impacts. And because that results in uh, greater variation in employment and growth, an observer would infer, in that case, a lower value to lambda. The third reason uh, for variant time variance in lambda uh, would be due to changes in the monetary policy transmission mechanism itself, either as a result of changes uh, in the financial system or the economy, or, uh, and I'm bringing in brain uncertainty, if, uh, because of changes in the instruments um, themselves. When such uncertainties are high, it's natural to take them into account favoring gradualism. In effect, this adds interest rate stability uh, to the loss function um, and reduces the relative weight on output stabilization. The fourth reason is if perceived risk to medium-term inflation expectations emerge, that itself could justify more concerted efforts to return inflation to target and therefore a, uh, a lower lambda. Um, it's not being an inflation nutter, but it's uh, being disciplined. And the last, and I want to expand for a moment on this, um, the last reason uh, of, of my reasons uh, for potential time variance is the role of unknowns in the economic outlook may be so prominent that they don't constitute risks, uh, but to quote Mervyn, uh, uh, radical uncertainties. These are uncertainties that are at once powerful and profound, yet difficult, if not impossible, to quantify over the monetary policy horizon, even with subjective probabilities. Their presence can raise the question whether policy should be conducted in a way that ensures against them by trying to avoid particularly bad outcomes rather than trying to optimize the mean as one would do in a simple certainty equivalence framework that I uh, discussed a moment ago. Now, some of the most important such, I'll switch terminology, but some of the most important such tail risks uh, relate to financial stability. Uh, it's clear that although it secured 15 years of inflation control and steady economic growth, price stability, narrowly uh, defined, uh, brought risks. In a sense, prior to the global financial crisis, the macroeconomic loss function was incomplete. Since financial cy cycles tend to be slow moving, operating at longer frequencies than certainly the policy horizon and even uh, the business cycle in many cases, this considerably complicates uh, trade-off management considerably more complicated if you only have one instrument. So uh, it was very welcome uh, that the principal remedy to this uh, challenge uh, has been the establishment of an independent financial policy committee at the Bank of England with a remit to protect and enhance the stability of the financial system of the United Kingdom. The MPC has a range of tools in its arsenal, um, and it's the first line of defense against such financial stability risks. But the remits of the two committees recognize that there may be circumstances where the MPC, and I quote, may wish to allow inflation to deviate from target temporarily, consistent with its need to have regard 
to the policy actions of the FPC. So to stretch uh, the framework, uh, the M in those situations, the MPC's loss function could be modified to include proximate indicators of financial stability. Um, and uh, the, the way this is defined here is there is a dummy variable, FPC, um, which is effectively turned on by the FPC. Uh, it's one when it's turned on, in other words, where the FPC sees financial stability issues has taken the actions it can uh, and recognizes that its defenses in some respects are uh, near to being exhausted and wants the MPC to start to take them into account. Um, so the judgments and the judgments formed around with, I can assure you, if you thought the rest of the framework was overly simplistic and there was false precision, the, the vector on the right-hand side of this uh, uh, exchange, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, loss function, uh, is truly false uh, precision, but anyways, these are a series of judgments that the FPC would make based on, based on data um, uh, around the financial stability risks. If it, if it runs short of its ammunition, raises the issue in coordination with the F MPC, and then the MPC uh, must weigh the appropriate monetary response within the context of its inflation target and its secondary objective uh, which is, again, in remit to, to support, and I quote, strong, sustainable, and balanced growth. So let me, let me move towards conclusion by uh, just talking a bit about the current outlook and how this framework uh, operates here. Um, back in May, the MPC said that the effects of the vote to leave the European Union on inflation would depend on the value of its, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, would depend on the balance of its effects on demand, supply, and the exchange rate. The MPC was aware that these effects could, in combination, mean a period of weaker growth but higher inflation, thus creating a trade-off for monetary policy to balance. In August of last year, the MPC made its first full assessment of these effects, by, and it responded by reducing bank rate by 25 basis points, by announcing 70 billion sterling of asset purchase, purchases and introducing a new term funding st scheme which was designed effectively to get um, that uh, bank rate cut passed on to end borrowers. And the majority of the MPC also indicated that if the economy evolved in line with the forecast at the time, um, they would support uh, further action. So let me use the framework, same uh, diagram you've seen before to illustrate this. Um, if the MPC hadn't responded, um, not provided any monetary policy stimulus, uh, in all likelihood, or at least in its estimation at the time, its forecast at the time, inflation would have been back around target uh, at around year two, so there's no overshoot of inflation, uh, but it would have opened up an output gap of around 1.5%, translating roughly with Phillips' curve to around a quarter million uh, lost jobs. Given our remit, some weight, society's preferences, ultimately, uh, that would have been uh, inconsistent and arguably un undesirable. So the next dot shows effectively what we expected to happen, given the stimulus that was put in place at the time. Um, you could move a little further out from there uh, if the majority had implemented what they intended to do, given the forecast. So in other words, um, the majority held back some of the stimulus because of the degree of uncertainty at the time. So even in August, uh, uh, the majority on the MPC was prepared to uh, tolerate a larger overshoot um, to balance the trade-off. Um, over the autumn uh, of last year, demand growth uh, remained more resilient than expected, particularly consumer spending, um, and that contrasted with a less sanguine uh, assessment of uh, prospects uh, in financial markets uh, as evidenced by a further uh, decline in the sterling exchange rate, uh, which put uh, upward pressure on the uh, inflation outlook. Um, there is an expectation, uh, you jumped ahead, uh, but you've got our trade-off that, uh, that we struck uh, there uh, back in November. Um, the expectation in November uh, is that there's going to be a resolution some coming together of this juxtaposition between strength in household spending, 
which denotes a, a relatively uh, a positive outlook, um, and the pessimism in financial markets, particularly in the exchange rate, um, and that in the forecast, that resolution is driven uh, as imported inflation begins to weigh on people's real incomes, and that slows uh, consumption growth. That moderation in household spending reinforces uh, the effects of uncertainty in, on investment. And as a consequence, in forecast in November, uh, growth remains below past averages for the next few years. Now, one of the uh, corroborating indicators of that potential deceleration in household spending is that the UK uh, expansion is increasingly consumption-led. And I don't mean consumption is the largest component of GDP, we all know that, but it's the contribution to growth of consumption is greater than contribution to growth of all other uh, components of GDP. Um, and experience both here and across a uh, range of advanced economies shows that uh, consumption-led uh, expansions uh, tend to be slower uh, and less durable uh, as ultimately as uh, consumption outpaces earnings growth, increasing debt, making demand more sensitive to changes in employment and income. So at present, we have a situation where households are almost entirely looking through Brexit-related uncertainties, savings rates are beginning to come down, and consumer borrowing has accelerated uh, notably in the year to November. Total household borrowing rose by 4 percent, and consumer credit rose by 10 percent, the fastest rate for the latter since 2005. So how household spending evolves and the intertemporal trade-offs that those households strike will be an, an important consideration over the course of the next few years. In November, as shown, uh, what the MPC uh, chose and what we reiterated is that we're choosing a period of somewhat higher consumer price inflation in exchange for a more modest increase in unemployment. But the MPC also noted at the time that there were limits to the extent to which it would target uh, or would allow and tolerate above target inflation. And those limits uh, depend on the causes of the inflation overshoot. The extent of second round effects on inflation expectations, one of my points earlier about time variance of lambda, um, and the scale of shortfall in economic activity uh, below potential. And they also depend on any risks around the development of imbalances that could threaten a sustainable return of inflation to target. Most recently, uh, to bring it up to date, there have been signs of continued solid consumer momentum domestically and of stronger uh, growth globally. The MPC will monitor all these developments in light of its inflation tolerance and explain its assessment and policy stance accordingly. But it, it will remain the case, in our judgment, uh, that the outlook for inflation will depend on that evolution of demand supply and the exchange rate. It remains the case that monetary policy can respond in either direction to changes in the economic outlook as they, as they unfold to ensure a sustainable return of inflation to the 2 percent target. So let me conclude with just a couple of final words. The first, what I've argued um, and what is the case, this, uh, I'm quite confident in this bit, uh, that the people of the United Kingdom have chosen price stability as the primary objective for monetary policy. To use the words of uh, Professor Sen, they have reason to value inflation control. Their preferences, the preferences of society, have been encoded in the MPC's inflation remit. That remit has been set, in, those preferences are set in statute. But even so, because it, inflation control cannot be perfectly contracted ex ante, there remains an element of discretion in how the MPC delivers its inflation uh, objective. And that's because that discretion exists, because the people of the United Kingdom also have reason to value stable growth, jobs, and incomes. And in exceptional circumstances, the trade-offs between real stability and inflation can arise that monetary policy is required to balance. This is now the case, given the decision of the people of the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. In coming years, the UK will redefine its openness to movements of goods, services, people, and capital. The flexibility and dynamism of this economy will help it adjust as it as it's, uh, adjust to its new relationship uh, to the EU, as that becomes clearer, as well as, as new opportunities with the rest of the world open up. 
over the next few years the magnitude of the effects of this adjustment or these adjustments on the economy's supply potential, on domestic demand, and on the value of sterling will be somewhat uncertain, and this process will have a significant bearing on inflation. But whatever transpires, the MPC will manage monetary policy to achieve the inflation target in a sustainable manner, consistent with not just the preferences, but the instructions of the people of the United Kingdom. So with that, I will finish, and thank you very much for your attention. Um, first check, it is working, isn't it? Can you hear me at the back there? Very good. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mark. And uh, I learned a lot, and I, I'm sure everyone here learnt a lot also. Um, and much to discuss, but thank you very much for sharing your reflections and for treating us like economists. <laughs> um, the... Uh, now, the next uh, part of our uh, proceedings is we'll ask uh, Amartya Sen uh, to offer some comments. Uh, Amartya, would you want to go up to the...? Well, I was going to do that, but you have changed the tradition, and I think we should distinguish between the speaker. You said both of us were speaking, but that's not quite right. <laughs> it uh, you come keep, to listen to him. Could you keep I'll, close to that one? <laughs> Oh, they, they, something happening? Yes. Nothing, huh? Yeah. Well, can you hear it? Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, I think uh, we had a truly brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, we knew, of course, that Mark Carney had been a great policy leader. And a great thinker, but also he, uh, the explanatory clarity, if I may say, of what you're trying to present to us seemed to be altogether striking. And in some ways, it has differed as, as an outsider, as I look at it, from the way that monetary policy making has often been viewed. Now, I'm not a monetary policy man. In fact, there's no truth in the rumor that there's a complete um, uh, sense of crisis in the Harvard Economic Department at the thought that I might be speaking about monetary policy. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> but if there was any reason for me to get some confidence to say a few things on that, it was partly because the way uh, Mark Carney has related monetary policy challenges with the other challenges that we face uh, in, in, in the economy and, and the society and the way we judge it in terms of um, what needs to be done and where does monetary policy fit into that. Um, I think I'm going to say a, a few words presently uh, on, on the um, dissociation thesis, which is, seems to me to be um, fairly strongly um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, rejected and challenged um, in in the way uh, Mark Carney has seen these problems, including the um, the way the Phillips curve works and what its implications are in the conflict between uh, the outputs and the uh, uh, picture as well as the stability picture. Um, I, I think the, um, the totality of um, an economy um, has to be seen as an integrated whole connecting the monetary policy with other things. Now, this has not quite happened. Actually, I was going to postpone that, but let me say something on this because I'm, I think I'm generating tension in saying <laughs> that there is a problem, but I'll tell you about it later on. Um, I think the way some of the things have uh, happened, uh, consider the Eurozone policy, uh, when, uh, and, you know, actually uh, led by someone whom I greatly admire, and Trichet had been an old friend of mine, 
and who I think is, is, a, is a great man. I, I, but at least I know that I did think that um, the leadership uh, he was providing in the, in the context of dealing with the crisis of 2008 was something which I dissented from and indeed could be described as, as uh, mistaken. Um, I think, but it wasn't only that I thought that uh, what we didn't need, uh, partly for Keynesian reasons, what we didn't need was an austerity to deal with a problem when there was a lot of unemployment and undercapacity working. Um, the great experts on the subject sitting here too. The, um, it's also the way it was assumed that, uh, that um, the financial leaders could simply take this decision and these have priority over, over other things. I mean, in, in, to, to broaden the issue, and, and, and Mark had encouraged me to do that indirectly by referring to the problems connected with uh, social choice and, and so on. Um, there had been a sense that um, democratic um, procedures are really not a part of this discipline at all. Namely, you decide on these things. Uh, the, if the economy needs certain policies, you simply, uh, in the views of the, uh, the, those who are determining uh, such issues as austerity, which is not a pure monetary policy, of course, it's largely fiscal too, but also monetary policy together, that somehow these do not require sanctions. Now, what has happened, it's not that the democracy hasn't worked in Europe, but it's been very opposite of what Mill, John Stuart Mill, wanted. John Stuart Mill thought that um, democracy is governed by discussion. Uh, it's not, he didn't um, um, invent the phrase, but the, uh, it's his idea that, uh, that others uh, put it in that form. Um, but um, the idea was that there has to be discussion and then something is going to emerge from the democratic discussion and that would have legitimacy. What has happened is that quite often these sort of policy decisions have been taken, not just monetary policy but also fiscal policy in which the um, uh, European Central Bank has played a leadership role, the EU has played a leadership role, which has led to discontent. When discontent happened, heads have rolled and the governments have fallen. But uh, that's not government by discussion. The government by discussion isn't that independent decisions are taken and then, and then if it doesn't, uh, if people don't like it, uh, they just fire the government, which happened one, one after another in the countries, uh, you know, France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and so on. So I think the need to pre-think what is the democratic mandate and how they relate this is a very major aspect, it seems to me, of the, um, the kind of motivation behind the presentation, as I understand it, uh, that, that Mark presented, that there, is, there are conflicting objectives, um, there is a monetary policy in some ways is determined as an exercise, I think you used the word engineering, and, and, and uh, you know, the ultimate objectives have been taken in, in a governmental process, uh, in a, which is the democratic governance and so on. And then uh, you proceed. Uh, then he, he pointed out that you couldn't really fully do it that way because you couldn't pre-contract it mostly because of reasons which he solidly outlined and fully understood uh, why. But that still means that the priority still remains to a great extent on in integration rather than dissociation. And, uh, and practical barriers to dissociation, um, uh, um, uh, to integration exist and, and we have to recognize that. But there is a general um, understanding that um, uh, there would be a kind of role of the 
uh, central bank, uh, in, 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 in the case of Bank of England, not only the governor, but also the Monetary Policy Committee and so on, which is linked with everything else that's happening in which the democratic process, procedure comes in. I think that's a major, um, uh, in my judgment, a major point to make about how to think about these problems. Now, it's interesting that um, this problem has arisen in pretty much all parts of the world, and I can talk about it in the context of Japan, and, and you know, the Kuroda's policy, how it's related to the government of Japan wanting to do particularly to get rid of what was essentially an austerity policy to move to a more bow and phase, which, which the government wanted. Uh, uh, it, um, uh, in the case of the United States, um, I think the use was made, very considerable use was made by the, by the President of the United States to be able to carry through some of the policies for which he had a mandate after being elected as president, but which the Congress wouldn't allow him to do. And, you know, the thank God that, they, that it could not uh, restrain the uh, central bank in the same way that, um, uh, that the Congress could restrain fiscal policy when people point out that the recovery from, the, from inflation, after all, in the Obama period was... Uh, rather weak. Well, part of the reason for the weakness is that what Keynes thought was the most powerful weapon, namely the fiscal aspect, that was not functioning. And the monetary policy had reached a level when the interest rate near zero, where Keynes actually comments on that, namely that you couldn't do very much about it. Uh, it turns out that you actually could do something, and, and, it, uh, and, and the central bank did achieve something, and we applaud, uh, a reason to applaud it too. And, and the, uh, uh, these seem to me to be absolutely central issues about economics. Now, sometimes, of course, people make a, the government may, be, may determine that um, they want to do something and do not allow the monetary authority any voice, but they may not have any voice. And if I take my country uh, in, in, in India, uh, when Raghuram Rajan, who was a, a, a truly excellent economist, was um, uh, the governor of the Reserve Bank of India, there are many things that the government uh, um, considered doing, he was in a position to say that, look, he didn't advise it. Uh, and that doesn't go against the democratic mandate in the million sense that a representative government allowed many institutions. Mm. Uh, if I had an opportunity, and uh, I would have said that it doesn't allow also taking huge decisions on the basis of one referendum. Uh, but I won't go into it because I know that I, I would be uh, rustling many feathers here uh, with that. But um, uh, then after he went and actually basically, uh, I don't know who the, the, the new chap is, the, the governor, the governor of the Bank of England, he may be a very fine guy. But, hmm? I know the name. I don't know him. <laughs> but we did the tell you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, he said, you know, like being somewhat like some doctors who give you, he said, oh, what you have is a condition called that. I said, yeah, but I, that's not what I want to know, what it's called. <laughs> I wanted to know what do I do about it. <laughs> so, uh, so the government decided that in, in, in on this day when American election took place on the 8th of November, uh, by coincidence, decided to do the experiment of suddenly taking 86% of the money supply off. And the result had been pretty much what you would expect, namely chaos. Uh, uh, <laughs> and so there was no one there to stop it. And in some ways, I think if you believe that democracy, I mustn't advertise my book, but if democracy involved an institutional feature, which is not 
periodic referendum, periodic election, and go to sleep in between. It's a constant dialogue that we need. Then that, that dialogue was absent. I mean, it's the, um, uh, the result of it was, uh, is, is, is been quite severe. The number, the, uh, the, uh, the, there have been reduction in jobs uh, and uh, already, and uh, there's more to come, and so forth. Now, so it's a kind of two-way process, and I like the way, uh, after recognizing that in some ways the monetary, poli monetary policy making is conditional on uh, uh, elected government wanting to do something and getting some kind of a public approval of that earlier. But then again, since you couldn't really do it, and he outlined, explained to us why you couldn't do it, um, then uh, you really ought to um, allow the monetary authorities to have some freedom. Now, I, 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 I don't know this, would it, uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, whether he would have stopped it, because he has been, he's not expressed any point of view on this subject. He is going to be asked now, apparently, what his views were. That's what some members of the parliament have been demanding. Uh, certainly a former Reserve Bank of India governor, named Manmohan Singh, who is also the former prime minister, have already said that this has been a total disaster. Uh, and so a, it's, a, it's a thing when we want a dialogue, and I... I the, the, there are many things about the British uh, economy and uh, which I learned from uh, listening to, and I was privileged to get an earlier version, earlier reading uh, Mark Carney thing. I wouldn't try to comment on it. There are a number of people I can see here who know much more about the British economy subject than I do, uh, and it would be wonderful to have that discussion. But uh, to me, it's very, very important to uh, look at the dialogic aspect of uh, what emerged. The fact that um, running an economy, running a society, is, is a quite a complex thing. And you require not kind of one shot throw of hand, but a constant dialogue about why did you say that? And Mark said, every time he made a point, he said, well, the reasons are the following. You know, look at the Philip Curl, look at this, and then you could see that this is a, an issue. And when that is missing, I think we really miss not only good governance, we miss something which is central to democracy, I think, which is dialogue, which is talking with people. One doesn't go, have to go all the way to the Frankfurt School to take, a, to take the view that, that that's the only way of thinking about democracy. There are many other aspects. But the dialogic aspects have been very important, has often been neglected, with your, uh, neglected in Europe, I believe. And here I'm getting uh, into territory that I didn't want to get into, namely a big decision being taken without any dialogue, just one show of hand and a, and a small ma margin of victory. And then as Gertrude Schein might have said, victory is a victory is a victory, uh, and then there's no further discussion on that. That's not the image of democracy that I have. So ultimately, what um, Mark has done for me is not only make me understand a little bit more clearly than I did on the, the different um, 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 concerns and compulsions that uh, come into monetary policy, but also to understand an aspect of the functioning of democracy, which is to bring all these considerations together, to sit together and chat. And I, I think um, uh, it, it's actually Badger who invented the word, the phrase, and, uh, that democracy is governed by discussion. But he was drawing on Mill, John Trott Mill. Uh, and I think that is a kind of gigantic uh, uh, idea. And um, I'm very grateful to Mark for making me understand it a bit more, a bit better. Thank you.
Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Amartya. Uh, you, you've both shown us in very strong, complementary but different ways how important it is to constantly question our understanding of how economies function and changes in how economies function, to constantly push and discuss openly though, and analytically those uh, issues. And at the same time, um, that's the kappa bit, if you like, and at the same time, the lambda bit, how we understand these problems and what we think about those problems. And that um, both of you, in your own way, emphasize how important that is for the quality of decision making and the democratic nature of decision making. So as we get involved in the technical details, I think that uh, scrutiny, both about the functioning of the economy and its changes, and about how we understand it and we, what we value and what we think, is fundamental. Um, and you showed us, Mark, that um, when a problem that's in the background pushes its way to the foreground, like stability, uh, what was uh, able to be suppressed in the formality of decision-making can't be suppressed anymore, and it has to come in and did come in, in a very explicit way. And that leads you to ask, well, what's the next problem or two that might push its way to the foreground? And two obvious ones are the concerns of the great classical economists, growth and distribution. We don't know now about underlying trend growth rates with anything like the confidence, misplaced or otherwise, that uh, we used to have. In my three years in the Treasury, where I was mostly working on Africa and climate change and um, suggesting things on tax reform that got buried. Um, I did interact a lot with the macro people, and they had a model then which had an unexplained trend growth rate. So there wasn't anything you could, it wasn't a policy issue because it sort of was there, even though you talked about it in rather general terms. It wasn't a policy issue in the model. Um, and there was nothing in the model that could possibly give you a prolonged slump because every time you were below, there was a mechanism in there that took you back up again, and every time you were above, there was a mechanism. So it didn't have either changes in growth or, um, uh, or prolonged Keynesian issues. And I think we've learned that, that that's not good enough, um, but I think what we don't want to do is to have one all-encompassing model that gives you everything under the sun. You know, you have to bring, as Frank Hahn, one of the great LSE professors, used to say, um, a model is a sentence in an argument, so arguments need more than one sentence. And so uh, when these things happen, we have to uh, try to bring other insights, other perspectives, and sometimes other models to bear on that. So if you could help us perhaps with... Um, uh, the question of is growth now so difficult after the crisis that it ought to be pushing its way forward in concerns of the big institu policy institutions of state. And one could ask a similar question about distribution too when we see you know, such small growth or even no growth in median income over a long period of time. Have these got to the point where the big institutions of state uh, whether they be in treasuries or banks of England or elsewhere, should take those into account. Um, Amar just pointed to the argument that much of this should be in treasuries, and I must say I agree with him very strongly in that. Um, but it does leave open the question how far in other institutions of state as well. Now, your mandate's complicated enough already. I don't want to load too much on it. But in the spirit that when stability got sufficiently worrying, you did have to get explicit, could that apply to growth and uh, distribution? And Mark, um, if you want to reply right away, you can, or we can open it up and you can pick up things in the course of the discussion. How would you like why, to do it? Why don't we do the latter, and I'll, I'll, I've made a note of that, and I'll catch it at the end at if the it end. doesn't come up elsewhere. Otherwise. Very good. Yeah. So I'm going to go to the um, lectern where I can, is, I'm a bit more democratic in my line of sight.
So um, please keep your question short. Please say who you are. Um, it's not limited to students, but it would be nice if we had quite a few students uh, asking questions. So um, the... Uh, uh, could you begin? And then I'm going to go upstairs. Can you hold up your hands up upstairs? There's a gentleman in a beard and a, what looks like a black sweater. So you're number two. Number one here, number two up there, and number three, the gentleman uh, over there. With the, there. Okay, so please go ahead. Sorry, no longer a student, but... Um, an alarm Is there a mic? Is there a mic anywhere? The mic just coming behind you. Sorry, no longer a student, but an alumni of LSE and a governor, Margot James, and a member of parliament. Um, I wanted to ask, um, following what you were saying, um, uh, Mr. Carney, about the consumption-led growth being less durable and sustainable. That is a concern, but then so is no growth. And I wondered what, what uh, either of you might comment on would be the, the best levers that you have seen maybe elsewhere in the world that uh, would have the potential to convert that growth that we now have um, to a more durable and sustainable model. Thank you. A gentleman up there, does the mic got you? Good. Hi, is that on? Yeah, perfect. Um, so I was a student at uh, LSC um, seven years ago. I work for an investment bank. Um, my question is uh, about inflation target. Um, so, what I want to ask is how uh, reasonable is for the inflation target to be pretty much similar over the last few decades in all the like Western economy. Um, it could be the case at the moment that the right inflation target could be different from what we, we had um, in the last several decades. Thank you. And the gentleman over here. Uh, yes, I am currently a student at LSE. Uh, my question is for Mr. Carney. Um, uh, given that uh, he said the objective of the bank is price stability, uh, as the Brexit negotiation unfolds, uh, what we can expect uh, regarding the value of the pound and uh, how much the bank... <laughs> <laughs> it's an obvious question. And uh, how, much, how much is the bank prepared to uh, take actions? Thank you. Um, <laughs> Mark, you... Okay. Yeah. On Take these on in your usual yeah. wisdom and discretion. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Did you say discretion? Yes. Um, in terms of um, Ms. James' uh, question uh, about uh, consumption-led growth, uh, d just underscore, I was making, the point I was making there is about what's actually happening in the economy today, as opposed to that being the growth model of the economy. So, um, and we're in a situation right now where, for understandable reasons, um, uh, business investment has been um, has been dampened by uncertainty, um, uh, not because of I mean there's access to finance, but there's some uncertainty about uh, ultimately what our relationship is going to be with our largest trading partner, and that's that's weighing on business investment. Uh, the government spending has been in a period of uh, or f the fiscal stance has been restrictive for some time necessarily somewhat less restrictive after the autumn statement, but still not contributing much to growth. Um, and we still have some trade drag. So the point is that what's driving growth is consumption, making a observation that the committee has made as well, which is that experience is that when the cycle goes into just being led mainly by consumption, that it tends to last, it, it tends to be less durable. In other words, there tends, that consumption tends to slow because inevitably what's happening is consumption ends up getting running faster than income, given the overall level of growth in the economy. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, I mean, that is a very high level reason, but that's one of the reasons why we do see uh, some slowing in the pace of household spending uh, over the course of this year, slowing in the pace of the economy over the course of this year. Uh, and that's a slowing, not a stopping. That's, a, you know, that's, that's the core forecast. Um, and from our perspective, um, that leads to a certain expectation of where uh, that trade-off is going to be and therefore the stance of the economy. So even though there are forces that are pushing up on inflation, the judgment of the MPC has been that uh, 
maintaining a degree of monetary policy stimulus makes sense. Now, we make that decision at each uh, meeting and we'll, we'll update that as, uh, as time goes on. So that, that was the point. Um, the second is that um, in terms of changing the inflation target, again, and this goes back to um, uh, the uh, constant dialogue, if you will, yeah. uh, that Marcia was uh, speaking of, uh, which is, and, and, and let me answer one of the points that, I, a broader point that he was making, uh, which is part of what I think you have to do in judgments that have been made around a monetary policy framework are how frequently do you change the main elements of that framework? Um, and so the hierarchy here has been, I mean, we have to, as uh, members of the MPC, and there's a number here who passed and present, um, uh, what we have to do is making those short-term judgments uh, about the trade-off or the stance of policy, we have to explain those. We're in a constant dialogue about what we're doing and why. We have to justify it. Yeah. Hopefully people will understand. Uh, some people will criticize, and that's that's fair. And there's a there's an iterative process, which is which is helpful and is accountable and ultimately democratic. So that's the first time phase. The second time phase is every year, the chancellor he or she sends a remit letter to uh, the MPC, which says this is the interpretation of the statute of what we mean by price stability, and the hierarchical preference of getting uh, the inflation target and do you have any secondary objectives and how are they managed accordingly? And so in, um, with experience, what has come into this has been a bit more specificity about the issue I was talking about, which is uh, the trade-off. And, and, and Charlie was there when, at the 2013 um, when the letter became clearer about the trade-off and with the new structure of the Bank of England, including financial stability responsibilities, made some cross-references to that as you would expect. So that's Again, const it, it's, it's, it's periodic dialogue, if you will, that comes through the remit adjustment process. The last element would be to actually change uh, the statute to give uh, your question, to give the bank additional responsibilities. I did it with financial stability. Would, you, would it make sense to give some other ones? I actually will dodge answering that. Well, I, I don't, pers my personal view is no, I wouldn't do it. Uh, I think we're in the response, we have enough, we have sufficient responsibilities, we don't have the instruments to directly influence. We need to explain where our responsibilities begin and end, and we need to explain the impact of our policies as best as we can tell on those issues. I mean, there is a distributional question around monetary policy which is raised, and um, several of us have actually come out and analyzed the impact of monetary policy on, on, uh, on inequality uh, in, in, in the UK and come up with the to us, a slightly surprising thing, even though it's not our objective, it's actually helped reduce inequality in the last several <coughs> years. It's not our objective. I wouldn't read it into our objective. Anyways, the point being that you have that frequency. To get to the inflation target question, one would change, one would make subtle adjustments if necessary to the target through the remit process, but there's a pretty high bar to making those changes given my view. Uh, there is a tremendous value to the heuristic of if you ask people what the, in if people know what the inflation target is, they know it's 2%. Um, that has a self-stabilizing uh, 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 policy or uh, uh, characteristic to it. Um, it also uh, is at a level that gives us some monetary policy uh, room, some uh, room to respond to shock uh, as necessary. So I, my personal view is that there's a high bar. In terms of, uh, Boy, is there ever a high bar to answering the other question, which is around uh, targeting the value of the pound. Um, you know, the best I can say is that the value of the pound will go up and down. Uh, in <laughs> <laughs> right now. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, <laughs> articulating the consequences of your actions for uh, issues of interest is a way of recognizing them. And, and in that sense, you have. Um, but of course, that's very different from folding it into an objective, uh, objective function. But it is actually a response to democratic concerns to articulate the consequences of your actions for things that people are worried about. Okay. Now, uh, who's, who's in possession of a microphone? Uh, well, there's a gentleman. You've got one, haven't you? And yeah, there's a gentleman just just there, near you, and then there must be a lady with a question. Top. Nick? Yes, number three. Yeah. yeah. And then 
Nick. Uh, and you, you'll be number. Well, I'll, do, I'll take four then. Okay. But please, please, uh, please be very quick because it might be the last lot. Please. <laughs> Now, could you use the mic? It's, it's really helpful. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, you made a very wonderful presentation. This is a dying question. Uh, my name is Aaron Du. I am currently doing my master's in development studies here at the LSE. Um, before um, Brexit, um, you may mention that the leave will trigger recession. A couple of days ago uh, at the Treasury uh, uh, Selected Committee, you said Brexit is no longer a risk to the U uh, UK of, uh, financial market, that it poses more threat to the entire Europe. Um, could you um, share more light on that and what makes that huge shift? Uh, should UK pursue hard Brexit? If the UK pursue hard Brexit, what are the unintended consequences? Thank you. Thank you. And there was a gentleman just here, and then the lady here, and then the lady over there. Uh, so, Mr. Carney, I originally had a, a similar question to the previous question, but I'll, I'll slightly change it. I'm kind of interested in, um, I guess, the new tools of monetary policy, in particular quantitative easing, as opposed to using the cash rate and the kind of distributional effects that has. I know you briefly uh, alluded to it previously, but I was wondering if you, you could explore that a little bit further, particularly for, I guess, young people who, who don't have a lot of assets. Um, naturally and the kind of impact that that might have on us. You have a future. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the lady just here, <laughs> particularly with an LSE education. No? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thank you so much for your speech. My name is Maria Carvalho and I'm at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. My question is with regards to a speech you made on the need for companies to start putting climate risks uh, to the portfolios in September. And um, the Financial Stability Board has talked about voluntary disclosures of climate risks to investors and to markets. To what extent will we start seeing um, central banks? Uh, what are the challenges that central banks will need to face and what, will, what information do they need to start putting climate risks to the economy? It, it really wasn't planted, Mark. <laughs> And leveraging off that question, um, my name is Ruth Knox. I'm an associate in the environment and climate change team at Linklaters, um, a law firm headquartered in the city. Um, where does carbon asset risk or climate risk uh, feature in the Lambda equation? Um, is it one of the radical uncertainties that you referred to, Mr. Carney, um, or is it hindered by the preferences um, that, that are regularly expressed to the MPC? Right. right, Mark, I, th I think that probably has to be the yeah. last okay. set of uh, questions, so if you could also use it to what whatever point you'd like to leave us with. And um, Amartya, would there be anything you'd like to add? Yeah. Well, um, so I'll go with the, I'll go with the first. Um, uh, you're, you're in development studies. Uh, you should be in media studies, uh, based on the way you uh, <laughs> took my words and uh, <laughs> took them to the absolute extreme. <laughs> Very impressive. Um, uh, what I said, uh, as you will know from the record, um, is that um, there was a possibility of a technical uh, recession back in May, possibility, possibility of major financial stability event. Um, so then it slightly goes to constant dialogue and motivating action again, is actually one of the things that we are mandated to do under statute and remit is to identify the major risks to either of our objectives, whether it's price or financial stability. So um, we have to do that. And you can tell in now seven and a half years' time whether or not we did it because the transcripts of the meetings and all the analysis at the time comes out. All the relevant analysis will be published. And so future uh, students or faculty will be able to ana analyze it. And uh, the fact is uh, that uh, at the time, um, we were quite concerned about a uh, series of positions uh, and readiness in the financial sector. Um, and we were in the process of getting a number of institutions to pre-position pre collateral with us, which put them in a position to borrow on demand a quarter of a trillion pounds. Uh, we were in a, uh, in a situation where we were putting in place a network of swap lines with other major central banks who were very concerned about the situation as well. Um, anyways, long short of it, we did a series of things 
to prevent exact or to mitigate prevent you can never fully uh, eliminate but to mitigate that risk um, and uh, that helped uh, the adjustment because no very few people were uh, well positioned uh, for it and certainly the positioning at the time that we said that would not have been consistent um, the by taking out the big financial stability risk at the time, uh, if you take away a big risk or you get through a big risk, well then, yeah, it is no longer the biggest risk if you've got through the night, so to speak. Um, and that is what happened. Now, we have said as a committee, this is Financial Policy Committee, that it's not the top risk, but the process of leaving the European Union does have the potential to reinforce the existing risks, uh, major risks to the UK, uh, household indebtedness, uh, current account imbalance, uh, and so forth. And so it is still there, but they, there's, you know, they are squared, those uh, statements. Second thing, um, in terms of um, the, uh, what was the, it was, I've written down tools and then, oh, this was, yeah, explain the tools, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, you have a future. That's 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 our gift uh, to you. Uh, is a is a future. No, I mean this is and it's a serious point. One of the big things, uh, particularly in the crisis period, uh, you know, great word hysteretic effects. Reality of hysteretic effects for most of the people in this room is uh, you don't get a job coming out, uh, and your lifelong learn uh, earnings. Are, are forever affected. I mean, it, it's absolutely, you know, graduating into a recession is a bad idea. Uh, try to go on to your doctorate if you can avoid it, um, because it literally will, uh, and, and, you know, that's not expressly in, but it's one of the reasons why society cares about big deviations from, uh, uh, from equilibrium and output and employment. Um, on the climate change, uh, I'll, maybe I'll just link the two. Uh, which is that um, the, uh, the Bloomberg report, uh, which is of the market, for the market, um, so it's developed by people who uh, prepare the accounts, uh, who um, issue the accounts, in other words, companies that raise capital, um, and by investors and creditors uh, to those companies. Uh, it has been backed by uh, businesses with market caps of one and a half trillion dollars, and financial institutions that control 20 billion uh, financial assets so far. Um, so on its, it's on its route to voluntary adoption because it is an issue, uh, as uh, the woman from uh, Linkletter knows, it is an issue for financial markets um, and for investors and for people who are looking over a cert, uh, out to a certain horizon, which brings it back to the Lambda question because and this is the tragedy of the horizon, which is that, and Nick knows this well, having started the whole thing, which is that the horizon over which you optimize monetary policy, for us, it's two to three years. In, and this goes to your question, um, if you stretch out to the financial, if there is a financial stability risk, a, an identifiable clear and present financial stability risk, you move out to the financial crisis, but it goes into sort of five, seven type year. I mean, that's a long time, but it, that's what you're thinking about where that radical uncertainty might land. And the challenge is that this risk really manifests itself beyond that in terms of actual physical risk that's hitting large uh, scale financial assets. And that the risk between now and then in most sectors, except for insurance, general insurance which has to manage it today in reinsurance, for most sectors, is the risk that comes from changes to the transition from here to there. And those changes can be because of changes in regulatory policy, government policy, or changes in technology, uh, all of which can uh, lead to a discontinuous transition. And so the way to, what the, the, the solution isn't for monetary policy, or even financial stability to immediately start a policy to start taking that into account, but is to make sure there's a market there that helps smooth the transition. And then that other authorities um, are taking their responsibilities. In other words, governments are taking their responsibility and judgment in setting the, the, the true climate policy framework. Um, so that's how it's squared. So I don't think we'll be seeing the, you know, well, we won't be seeing that into the loss function uh, for, for those reasons. Thank you, Mark. Um, could I ask you um, one thing um, before I thank the speakers? And that is, if you could stay seated until the three of us have left the stage, that allows us to get out in one piece. 
but mm. having the, uh, that's the administrative thing. But um, the much deeper intellectual story is to thank you both, Mark and Amartya, enormously for taking us through uh, the issues. For, um, not only a real intellectual story, but I think showing us an exercise of real value, a model, if you like, uh, for um, public reasoning and serious democracy. So thank you both very much indeed. Thank you.